So like others before me, I've discovered that 10 minutes is really not very long and there's an awful lot to cover, so I'm just going to have to go through a lot of this very quickly. Um, the idea is to give a brief overview of um, what are the, the health risks that exist along the value chain um, and what are some of the driving forces behind the trends that we see towards increasing risks along the value train, um, particularly in developing countries. Um, I have a quick look at how these health risks impact not just on health but on, on livelihoods and in particular look at how the poor and developing countries are um, particularly affected. So the, the video you've just seen describes the importance of taking a risk-based approach that takes into account local realities in the context of developing countries <coughs> where your agri-food industry is dominated by small-scale producers, traders and retailers. Um, what I want to look at and what we want to talk about in the rest of the afternoon is what opportunities are there uh, that are going to be able to benefit those actors while improving health outcomes. Uh, and these are obviously going to be different for different agricultural products. We're talking about high value products, staple products, uh, pr uh, production for home consumption. And of course, there's the, the whole production system and transformation system along the value chain. Um, now this isn't um, so just very quickly to run through what are the health risks? Well, we can categorize this as your microbial risks, um, uh, particularly related to unsafe water, lack of hygiene and insufficient sanitation, um, and are particularly uh, important in relation to um, uh, diarrheal diseases, to helminths, um, and so on. And of course, also within this category come uh, your zoonotic diseases. Um, and this is, uh, says 61% of the pathogens known to affect humans are zoonotic in origin. Uh, then we have plant toxins, cassava, fava beans, a lot of plants, very common staple plants, uh, contain natural byproducts, toxic byproducts, um, that can have very chronic effects on, on health. Uh, and then there's a whole class of mycotoxins, um, which are toxic. Uh, byproducts of fungi commonly found across the world. Uh, one under a lot of interest at the moment is aflatoxin. Uh, it's a big problem in Texas, it's also a big problem in Central America, in Africa, in Asia. Uh, it affects CDC, reckon that uh, aflatoxin's impact on 4.5 billion people are chronically exposed to aflatoxin. <coughs> and that chronic exposure, uh, these, these toxins are highly carcinogenic and they've also been linked in cases to stunting in children. Um, a, an amazing figure, 25% of the world's food crops are thought to be affected by mycotoxins, um, which is an astonishing figure. Um, then we have uh, chemical and physical contaminants, um, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. Uh, in addition to acute poisoning, they have far wider implications uh, for chronic exposure again, linked with cancers, respiratory diseases, and neurological conditions and, and, and damage. Uh, and then we've also heard a fair bit today about the rise of non-communicable diseases uh, and that the rate of increase in non-communicable diseases is, seems to be outstripping those of infectious diseases and pathogens. So um, this is also having a, a, an impact in terms of changing diets and so on. And I know uh, that Lescheck will be work, um, talking more about those later. Um, and these health hazards <coughs> exist and can be com exacerbated entire, along the entire food chain. So it doesn't matter how simple or how complex your food chain is, uh, the safety of the final product that is being consumed is only going to be as good as your weakest link. So you need to be able to take into account the whole food chain from your inputs, uh, the amount of chemical pesticides, when and how they're being applied, all the way through your production system, your storage system, your handling, transport, processing, all the way through to, um, to, to where you're actually going eating your food. Uh, I don't know why this is... No, I, it's jumping. I'm just going to try and restart. Don't you look hard for me. Okay, try again. Um, and when we're looking at food safety in the value chain, there's also the concept that food safety is in of itself a value. So where you lose, where your food becomes unsafe, you then by definition are losing value, which is why we want to look at the, the value chain as opposed to just purely looking at it as in terms of supply. Um, so just quickly, really doesn't like that one. Okay, I'm looking at factors um, that are driving, what's, we're seeing an increase in health <coughs> risks uh, generally across the board. 
Um, um, I just wanted to outline the three main factors that we see as driving that increase. Um, the slide it really doesn't want me to show you is, is describing the increased population of food demands. Um, there's a trade-off between increased production and safety. And um, obviously increased production requires an intensification of production, uh, which we've seen over the last 40, 50 years, a massive increase in the use of chemical inputs to produce the amount of food that we require to eat. Um, also, <coughs> alongside that, we're seeing increased disturbance of natural habitats to, uh, f uh, f um, to meet our increased needs. And so exposure to zoonoses between wildlife, humans, and domestic animals is becoming more of a risk. Um, there's links between changing practices uh, and increasing ir irrigation and exposure to malaria. Um, and then also we've heard in the last few days about this focus on just, just increase in cereals and the impact that that's having on nutritional status. This is, I'm not touching it, I'm not doing anything. Um, so when we look at a uh, second factor, increasing health hazards, um, we wanted to look at urbanization and water security, water sc scarcity. So half of our population is now urban. Um, we heard this afternoon, I think it was by 19, but this morning by 1950, more like 80% of our population is going to be urban. And that has two impacts when we're looking at health hazards. Um, the first is in relation to the use of peri-urban and urban agriculture and an increasing reliance on um, wastewater irrigation uh, with a lot of hazards related to that. The other thing associated with urban uh, urbanization is when we look at the value chain, there's a lot less personal links. Uh, it's a lot more anonymous. And so you don't have that assurance of where your food is coming from and where it's going to. So this idea of where is your weakest, weakest link in your health, uh, in your value chain, uh, is becoming more important within the context of urban uh, feeding urban populations. Um, and then finally, we have this changing diets, which we've heard about a lot today. Um, with improved nutritional status, the con increased consumption of animal products, of milk, of dairy, of fresh fruit and vegetables, all of these products tend to be a lot more perishable. And with that become um, more health hazards and more health risk. And uh, these health risks, wherever they exist, can produce uh, come at a significant cost, both in terms of health. Uh, I read in one of the briefs, 5% of a household's annual income can be spent on just treatments for malaria. Uh, and today we also heard a bit about the cost of non-communicable non disease, both in terms of health and in terms of uh, productivity. Um, but there's also a cost in terms of lost access to markets and a lot of regulations in terms of uh, food safety and standards are acting as an effective barrier to a lot of developing countries to be able to actually access those markets. Uh, World Bank estimates that zo zoonotic diseases in the last decade cost in the realm of $200 billion uh, in terms of indirect and direct cost costs, losses on the world economy. Excuse me. Um, and we've also seen from some of the work at IFBRI that these losses the effect of, of panic among consumers in relation to health risks can have a much greater impact on your producers and others along the value chain <coughs> in terms of economic loss. The, the demand shock tends to be much broader. It doesn't even have to be related to an actual uh, risk. So we found demand shocks in East Africa where um, people were worried about avian influenza outbreaks had a much greater impact on farmers than taking out the supply or removing the supply. Uh, which. Again, um, the idea of this image, it shows that the c way in which health and health hazards are communicated can have a massive impact on markets and therefore on, on livelihoods. Um, yeah. It really is not being nice to me today. Okay. Um, the slide that you're not seeing there. <laughs> uh, a lot of these health hazards are, are particularly hard on the poor and developing countries for um, five main reasons. Um, information is a, 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 has a huge impact, both in terms of information received by consumers on, uh, on health risks of, of food that they're eating, but also information to producers and other along the, others along the value chain in order to access markets. Uh, if you're a producer and you don't know what the market mm. desires or what the requirements are or what the uh, regulations are in terms of pesticide use and other things, you're, you're going to be blocked off from those markets. So access to information has a huge impact. 
Um, in developing countries, it, once you get sick due to these health risks, you've got the problem of, of access to, to, to health care. Um, generally speaking, in developing countries, governance and oversight of health hazards is much weaker, uh, which is obviously exacerbated by a lack of infrastructure, of testing capacities, and of financing to actually implement and supervise regulation. Uh, and a huge constraint is, is related to the cost of compliance and the economies of scale that act against them. Safe food costs money to, to produce, and a lot of those costs of fixed costs may relate to certification, which we'll hear more about, uh, hygiene and sanitation, and those are very difficult for small-scale producers to bear. Uh, and finally, in terms of impacts on the poor, where we've seen health uh, regulations being imposed, these can actually end up reducing the amount of safe food, uh, reducing the, the more nutri nutrient-rich foods um, to the poorest because they suddenly, it, it pushes, it by creating an additional cost, it makes it unaffordable um, by, by many of the poor and, and some of the proposals for uh, pasteurization of milk, for example, actually saw a reduction in, um, in consumption of milk. But So the poor obviously are suffering most, but in the other way of looking at that is there's the most potential in terms of them being able to benefit from shifts towards increasing um, uh, health, safe, food safety along the value chain. Um, so I want to just look at very quickly at what some of those opportunities might look like. Um, Market-based solutions may be appropriate in some some situations. I'm just going to try one more time. Um, and in particular, the, I think the place where we found market has most potential. Uh, the place where markets probably have most potential is where you can create a, a, um, a premium cost. So if safe food costs money to produce, um, what that, that can only be borne if that's carried through to your consumer. <coughs> you could just leave it open and I'll just move it over. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so in this particular case, um, in developed countries, we've seen that a lot of the drivers towards uh, food safety has come from consumer group, from a lot more access to information about the way food is produced, the way food is processed. And that's been um, helped along by these large-scale large supermarkets and other large-scale agri-food industries that are using food safety as a way of creating a price premium for themselves and, uh, and attracting uh, a, better, a better market and a, a, a more stable uh, rep uh, to, to give them a competitive edge, um, and in addition to you know rep reputational reasons, uh, and in developed countries you've seen there's a willingness to pay, and out of that willingness to pay, um, base is largely based on credible information in relation to health risks. From that, people, um, your producers are taking that willingness to pay that exists on the side of the consumer, and are therefore able to invest in production systems, in processing systems, in storage that will enable them to uh, produce safer food that can then get accessed into these markets, which will increase their income, which can increase their health. Um, and when we look at, in developing countries, we find there's very little evidence that really says how much does that translate into developing countries' uh, domestic markets. Um, there's some research, and I think we're going to hear a little bit more about that from Bushana, that shows that where there is increased income and where people really have credible, good information about the health risks um, associated with, um, or, or the health benefits associated with some of this higher cost food with, which meets certain standards, they are willing to pay more. Um, but we don't know enough about how generalized that is and the kind of products. Um, and obviously that is dependent on um, oversight, effective oversight, uh, on technology that can reduce the costs to those producers as far as possible. And we're also seeing that it's dependent on, um, on, on producers and others along the value chain in some way seeing those benefits right from a, an early stage in the production process. Uh, as I said, safe food costs money to produce. Uh, in this case, when you look at something like milk, um, the cooling systems 
require an investment and large-scale industries are beginning to figure out that they're going to have to work with small-scale farmers and so they're looking at ways in which they can develop resource providing contracts that provide some of the, uh, the, the initial costs that allow those initial costs to be overcome that then um, allow the smaller producers who may only have one or two cows to be able to feed into that, uh, into that system. Um, and obviously that requires on, relies on technology. So in, in the case of milk, a technology that can actually test for the safety of the milk on the spot when, the, when, when farmers are bringing their milk to the center um, allows, creates that in disincentive for unsafe food as well as the financial incentives to, to produce safe food. Um, but obviously that's not going to work across the board. What about low value staples? Um, what we're seeing is uh, in, in Kenya, the example we have here is the production of maize in Kenya, and this is part of a, a project that IFPRI is involved in looking at aflatoxin contamination with a number of partners, in, including Farid, who's here in the, in the audience from uh, ICRISAT. Um, and initial data, initial data from this study is basically showing that while farmers may say, may say they're willing to pay for contamination-free maize, they might even say they're willing to pay for, to invest in some of the low-cost technologies to reduce the risk of contamination. When you talk to the large-scale millers, they're saying, well, why, why should we pay a premium? We can go and get safe maize down the road. There's no value to them to, to, increase, those, uh, to, to, to increase the price for, for safe food, where where, especially where the value of that safe food is not recognized by consumers across the board. And in such cases, your market-based approach cannot work. And that's where you need to pull on the public health imperative as well. Uh, you need a combination of consumer demand and information, government oversight, but it also requires low-cost te uh, low technologies. And one of the big constraints that we're finding in the ca case of aflatoxin is that the cost of testing is so high and so difficult uh, that that's creating a, a, a barrier to governments and also to private sector to get involved and say, yes, we, w we really want to push this along and we want to ensure that we have aflatoxin-free uh, maize because, A, how do you know if it's free or not? How do you know what the contamination levels are, not and are or not? And B, when you find that contamination, what are the alternative uses? So there are a lot of challenges uh, that we're finding along the way. Um, So just to sum up, if we're assuming, and I think we can now assume that food safety is a crucial element of food security, we need to find what are the incentives that we need to produce safe foods. Uh, I've put some incentives there. I could equally say what are the disincentives to produce unsafe food, because I think it needs a balance of the two. And those incentives, financial incentives are not going to be enough. By themselves, the market can't resolve all of these problems, especially where <coughs> producers are, are, are consuming the, their own food, that food isn't even hitting the, the value chain. It's going to require political uh, commitment, uh, it requires an understanding of social reality, and it also is going to require technical innovation. And when we're looking at some of the incentives to improve production and food handling systems, uh, we need to look at the institutional arrangements, and that will include both horizontal coordination, um, such as farmer associations that can help reduce fixed costs, uh, help share information, get involved in, in certification and so on, um, but also where possible um, vertical coordination to, uh, in, to, um, uh, sorry, to, to, to facilitate the, the um, monitoring across the value chain from production all the way through to consumption. We need a commitment to strengthen oversight, um, but as we saw in the video, a, a kind of government coming in from the top and telling everybody this is going to be the solution is never going to work in systems where you're you're dominated by small-scale producers. Um, and so we need a risk-based analysis and interventions that are appropriate to um, the local realities so that any solution is both politically and socially feasible as well as economically feasible. And to achieve this, as we've heard again and again today, it, it's, a, it's an engagement um, to really achieve uh, coordination across your value chain. It's about relationships, it's about linkages, and that's true uh, across resolving all of these problems of institutional arrangement. Um, you need to create linkages that incorporate not just your producers and your consumers, but your traders, your handlers, the importers, the exporters, uh, your international trade and health organizations, and of course the government institutions, public health, production, and oversight. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Thanks very much. <laughs>